Hey, boy, we have a stimulating crowd this morning. When I got here, there was not a single car in the parking lot. I was wondering if you were all coming. Glad you joined me. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Yellow communication cards are still where they're supposed to be in the back of the seat pew in front of you. And if you're a a first-time guest. Well, if you're a visitor of any kind, we'd like to have you fill that out and leave it on the pew. And if you're a first-time guest, please stop by the Welcome Center just out through these doors. We have a gift that we would like to give you to commemorate your visit today. Uh, we've got a couple of fun things that are going on on Saturday, December 5th. So coming up next Saturday, there's the annual Happy Birthday Jesus Party. All children are invited to attend that party at 9.30, that would be a.m., in the Fellowship Hall. And Debbie Buxton needs to know by December 1st. That's what, day after tomorrow? Yeah, day after tomorrow. Debbie needs to know so she can plan for the treats and the crafts and spacing the kids out and all that fun stuff. Also, on the same day... Um, decorate the church for Christmas at 10 o'clock. If you are not able to come for the two or three hours that it takes to decorate the whole church, then please set aside whatever time you do have. If you've got 30 minutes or an hour, please feel free to come and join. You don't have to be here right at 10. You can slide in at 10.30 and stay for a half hour, whatever time you've got. And uh, Tita and Lori will give you your marching orders and instruct you in what needs to be done. Everything will be out and ready, and you'll have a good time. Now, the following weekend, Sunday, December 13th, will be the first half of our annual meeting. That will be immediately followed by the morning service, so I hope you will join us for that. If you're a member, you will be voting. If you're not a member, you are certainly welcome to sit in. The meetings never last very long. They're not these awful meetings that go on forever. They're always really quick here. So, uh, but you're welcome to sit in and listen so you know what kinds of things are going on here at this church. Um, offering box is still out in the foyer. If you would like to make contributions to the church or to any specific ministry, you can uh, make a notation on the envelope and drop that in. And uh, also, I just want to remind you that out in the foyer at each of the doors, we have uh, dispensers for hand sanitizer. It is cold and flu season, so we'd love to see you make use of that, just so we're not sharing a whole lot of fun stuff around. And we'll keep more people in the sanctuary on Sunday, and few of you feeling like you need to watch from home. So, please be sure and read your bulletin. There's a lot more stuff in there. Pastor John. Well, I certainly want to add my welcome to all of you who are joining us here in the service this morning and all of you who may be joining us via live stream. It is always good to gather in the name of the Lord and to worship him, and so it is good for us to gather together today. Just a, a, a little addendum to the announcements. Uh, they are posted out here. Our, our uh, first half of the annual minutes, uh, our first half of our annual meeting uh, announcements are out there. It shows our budget. And one of the things we're proposing uh, that Brett wanted me to, to mention, uh, there was such generosity in our Harvest Home giving. Uh, the giving from our Harvest Home plus some money that was in the missions allowed $18,000 to be shared with our missionaries. That's about $1,000 per missionary. And one of the proposals from the elders is to take some of the abundance of giving that we've received so far this year and double that. So add another $18,000 to send to our missions. So the wonderful giving that's come from this congregation that allows us to have an abundance this year, we want, we're proposing $18,000 of that go to be sent out to those missionaries so they get doubly blessed. That would be $2,000 for each missionary. Several of those missionaries, we support $600 a year. So imagine they're gonna get triple that or more in, in one giving through, the, through, through Christmas. So anyway, those are some of our proposals out there. Take a look at those. They're two weeks ahead, our, our annual meetings in two weeks. And if you have any questions, certainly you can contact any pastors or elders. Those are on those welcome boards as you come in each of the doors. So, yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, you may have seen it on Facebook last week. The, the ladies mentioned that there was a mug and muffin plan for uh, the 12th, I believe, and that has been canceled. So all of you ladies, that has been canceled. We want to make sure that you're aware of that and, 
and don't happen to show up. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact Anna Peterson, okay? All right. Would you all join me in a word of prayer this morning? Oh, Father, we come to you this morning with joyful hearts. It is a time of thanksgiving, and we've had a wonderful time gathering with friends and family or, and others. Uh, many are still away with their family, taking advantage of this time, and it is a time of being encouraged. And we just want to come and share our thankfulness to you. Lord, we have so much that we are deeply indebted to you for. And so, Lord, right now, we just give you thanks that we can gather, that we can open up your word, we can listen to you speak to us, we can respond in prayer, we can respond in worship to you. And Father, we know that you deeply love us and you deeply care for all of our needs. In ways that we may not be able to see, you are working in our lives and around us and through us in ministering to others. So Lord, now we do lift up the unique needs that happen to be in our congregation today, whether they be spiritual needs, whether they be personal, whether they're financial, Lord, in all of these things, we lift up to you and ask that you would work in people's lives. Those who are sick, give them comfort, give them your uh, healing hand. Uh, for those who are troubled, give them a peaceful heart, knowing that you are in control, and, and show them your way of finding resolution. For those who are lonely, Father, gather others around them and also just uh, put your arms around them and comfort them. All of us, Father, we have ongoing needs, and Lord, we know that those are ultimately met in you, and so Lord, we just give you thanks this morning and acknowledge that. And Father, we just pray that in some humble way, our worship this morning, whether in song and in prayer, in responding to your word, in giving of our, of our finances as you've blessed us, all of that is to re reflect our worship of you. And so all of this we thank you for in the name of Jesus, amen. And if you would, stand with me for our verse of the month. Romans 8, 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Romans 8, 19. And now remain standing as Kim comes and leads us in worship. Good morning, Will. Be singing this morning several classic hymns as we always start our service. Normally at the end of the service we have a more contemporary part of our service, but our contemporary worship leaders are gone, so you'll have me for one more song at the very end, so I hope you don't mind. But anyway, we're going to start with, um, We Come, O Christ, to You.
Now let's read together our scripture reading from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 100.
Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning to all again. It is a joy to be here with you. It is a joy to have the opportunity to open up the Word most of the time. <laughs> there are those occasions when I open up the Word and... Uh, on the surface level, it's not so enjoyable. It uh, is kind of like a two by four across my forehead, which is never pleasant on the surface, but maybe good and healthy for me. And it was one of those things that happened to me just recently that kind of influenced what I'm sharing this morning. In Hebrews, we're studying downstairs in Sunday school. And by the way, today, there is no Sunday school. We were coming to worship, to be here for this time, uh, but there is no Sunday school, so after the worship service, uh, continue to spend time with friends and family and enjoy this long Thanksgiving weekend. But there was a verse that uh, I read, and somehow the Lord used it to speak to me. It's in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, and it says, About this we have much to say, it is, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. And that just kind of swatted me. And in my mind, I began to wrestle with that just a little bit and think, what is that speaking to me? It's kind of like a slap in the face. And I was just trying to say, Lord, what does that mean? And, and for me, someone who has known the Lord for a long time, it was, John, don't become complacent. Don't just assume and be comfortable with what you know. When someone opens up the Word and speaks, teaches, shares a message, when you open up the Word and you find a familiar verse, don't just simply say, oh yeah, I remember that verse, and go on. Because it's the Word that God is speaking to me today, and sometimes that dull of hearing is simply me just gl gliding over the true truths that are so significant and so meaningful. And so today I want to share with you, as a result of that, four things that I'm extremely thankful for. 
Four things that, are total, that totally, radically changed my life. And I don't want to be dull of hearing. I don't want to just gloss over them. I want to stop and, and consider them. Four life-altering things that I'm thankful for and deeply, deeply indebted. And the first one comes from, um, you know, you know you, someone who reads a book and they've read it to the end and you haven't read it and they want to tell you how the story ends and you say, no, 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 no. That's now become something that's happened in my, my wife and I's relationship through binge watching, watching a show. It's like, well, I, hey, have you seen the finale yet? Have you got that far? Well, let me tell you what happens. No, my wife doesn't want to know what happens. She doesn't want me to tell her the end of the story. And neither would you. But as it relates to my first thankfulness, it's nice to know the end of the story. My first thankfulness is, I'm glad that Genesis 3 is not the end of the story. I'm thankful that Genesis 3 is not the end of the story. Because Genesis 3 is not a pleasant place. Genesis 3, we read of, of lying, of deceit. We write of hiding. We read of Satan and deception. We read of the consequences of sin and of blame. He did it, she did it. And that's not a very pleasant place to end. But the reality is, we know the end of the story. We jump ahead to the end of the book in Revelation 20, 21, 22, and we know the end of the story. And so I want to share with you, back and forth, Genesis 3, and, and 1 through 3, and Revelation 20 to 24, because you, you probably are familiar that if you read of, of the tree of life in Genesis, you're going to see the tree of life in Revelation, of the river, you're going to read the river in Revelation. But let me go through these. And I borrowed these from the walk through the Bible. They've put them together pretty succinctly. So if we can get those up there. In Genesis, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But in Revelation 21 it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. In Genesis, the darkness he called night. In Revelation, there shall be no night there. In Revelation, God made two great lights, sun and moon, but in Revelation, the city had no need for the sun or of the moon. In that day, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, but in Revelation, there shall be no more death nor sorrow. Satan appears as a deceiver of mankind, but in Revelation, Satan disappears forever. In, Re in Genesis, it, we're shown a garden into which defilement entered, but in Revelation, we're shown a city in which there shall be no, by no means enter anything that defiles. In Ge Genesis, the walk of God with people inter is interrupted, but in Revelation, the walk of God with people is restored completely and entirely. We have the initial triumph of the serpent in Genesis, but the ultimate triumph of the lamb in Revelation. God multiplies sorrow and pain. In Revelation, there shall be no more pain. The cursed is the ground for your sake, and there shall be no more curse. Man's dominion broken in the fall of the first man, Adam. Man's dominion is restored in the rule of the new man, Christ. In the Genesis, the first paradise is closed, and in Revelation, the new paradise is opened. In Genesis, we have access to the tree of life disinherited to Adam, but in Revelation, access to the tree of life is reinstated in Christ. In Genesis, they were driven from God's presence, but in Revelation, they shall see his face, and the they is we. We are the ones who will see his face. And so, it's an encouragement to me today. There's a peace that I have, and sometimes I overlook, and I'm not even, I don't even think about it, but there's a peace that comes from knowing the end of the story. Because I know Christ, I know the end of the story. And I know speaking with a number of folks, even my mother-in-law, there's a peace that comes from her, knowing what's on the other side when she, the day comes that she passes. 
There is a peace knowing the future. And so I'm extremely, extremely thankful. We have a forever future that is assured. God has had a purpose. He had a plan in Genesis. And we know in Revelation that his purpose and plan is not thwarted. It is completed. What God begins, God will finish. And you know what? That also speaks to me. Because it tells me that the work that he has done in my life, he will continue to do until it's finished. In Philippians it says, And I am assured of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to its completion on the day of Christ. God has a purpose in my life. God has a purpose in your life, and it will not be thwarted. He will do his work in our life. He is very completely faithful to complete what he begins. So the first thing I'm thankful for is I'm thankful that we know how the story ends and the comfort that that brings to us. The second thing I'm thankful for is the gospel. All of this book tells the story from Genesis on of a faithful, loving God seeking a relationship with us. And at the center of that, at the core of that, is the gospel of Jesus. You cannot read through the epistles um, without seeing Paul, who was all in. Paul totally gave himself to the gospel, to being committed to the gospel, and committed in, give, in sharing the gospel. This man was in prison for four years or more. He was, he was run out of the city. He was beat. He was rebuked. He was mocked. And yet he continued because of his commitment to the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus. And it's that gospel that changed my life. It's that gospel that changes your life. It's the gospel message of Jesus. Where the creator entered into his creation in the person of Jesus Christ who lived a life that no one could live. He was perfect. He willingly went to the cross, the Roman cross, and gave his life to pay a penalty that we could no way pay. God the Father raised him back to life to show that he accepted and approved of that sacrifice so that Believing and placing our faith in Christ. Can you think of that day that you placed your faith in Christ? So that believing and placing our faith in Christ, we can experience forgiveness of our sin and all of our rebellion. Through what Christ did, we can have that relationship. We have that relationship with God. Broken in Genesis, we have that relationship with God restored. And through Christ, we can experience forever with God. And I don't think we can really understand that. I think that is beyond our imagination. The concept that because of the gospel, because of what Christ did, that we have a forever with God. I am so focused on today and tomorrow and the next week, and this is such a speck in time for a forever with God. Think for a moment of that time when you responded to the gospel. It's interesting to me, I was not raised in a Christian home. I was raised in a good home. My parents loved me. They were not... My dad particularly did not come from a home that followed Christ. It was just kind of ambivalent. It was just all about work and family. And, and that's the home that I was raised in. And January of, two, of 1971, a month and a half from now, 50 years, since a man met me and with a group of kids, at what's now Valley View Middle School out here on 10th, Valley View High School at the time. Didn't know me, had basketball playing, 
and afterwards shared a devotional and said, does anyone want to talk more about Jesus? And I raised my hand. And it was that night that I responded, believing and placing my faith in Jesus Christ, and I became a new creation. It's humbling to think it's been 50 years. But it is amazing to me to stop and think how my life has been so totally radically changed because of that night of responding to the gospel. It helps me understand a bit of why Paul was so committed. His life was so radically changed, and my life has been radically changed. Your life has been radically changed in becoming a new creation, but also walking with God and the change that comes from that. Stop for a moment and just imagine. It it kind of blows you away to think what your life would have been, what your career would have been, what your marriage would have been, who your family would have been if you had not responded, what your life would be if you had not responded to the gospel. I am so deeply indebted for the gospel of Jesus Christ and the change that is made in my life and your life. You know what? I doubt that I would know any of you. I wouldn't know any of you, probably. Well, maybe Carl and Teresa, if I married their sister Peggy. I don't know. See, I just go back and I go, wow. What would my life be without my wife? What would my life have been like? All of that to say how deeply thankful I am for the gospel, the change that it brought to my life. The third thing I'm thankful for is that I'm loved. That we are loved. And I just want to read some verses to you. I just want you to kind of sit back and just soak this in. Much of this comes out of Ephesians and Romans, uh, out of 1 John. But let me just read to you. My wife has charged us as a family. She's challenged us. She's read a book about 90 days of what's gone well in your life or some book like that. But she's challenged her family through uh, texting. We've got a family group. So my son Chris and his wife Katie, my son Jaron and his wife Caitlin, my daughter Nicole and her husband Joey, Peggy and I are in this group. And she's challenged each day to think of something that's going well. And so she posted yesterday this verse but that she was thankful for but god being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses trespasses made us alive with christ by grace you have been saved listen to some other verses ephesians 1 Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Ephesians 3.14 For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend. Grasp that. Have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's healthy for me to be reminded of the impact to know that I'm loved. To know that I'm loved by God, to know that I'm loved by my spouse, to be loved by my children, to be loved by you. In Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore no con- now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. There is now no condemnation. Whatever my mind may think, the truth of the word says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why does my mind occasionally think, but, and I have an exception. That's a pretty complete list. There is nothing that separates us from the love of God. In 1 John 1, 3, or 3, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. I think that may be the closest I can come in my mind, in my limited mind, to grasping the love. The love that I have for my wife, the love my wife has for me, the love that I have for my children is probably as close as I can come, and yet it pales when I think of the love that is, is written there in the Scripture, the truth of Scripture. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The supreme statement of God's love for us, the sacrifice of Christ, that, that's the basis for the gospel. Have you ever noticed in that book, in that book there in John chapter 3 what comes just before it and just after it? Just before it become, comes Nicodemus, the Pharisee, the, the wealthy religious leader who knew all and, and, and could, could stand up with anyone as far as his obedience to the law. And Christ says, ah, oh, you need to be born again. And the other side of that familiar verse is the Samaritan woman who went in the, during the middle of the day to, to try and stay go at a time when no one else would be there. Her life was just a shame. She had husbands before, and the one she was with now wasn't even her husband. And God reached out and loved both of them, and right in between that, I kind of call it a gospel sandwich, because we were familiar with John 3.16, but when we recognize that here's the man, the woman, Pharisee, uh, a woman whose life had, was a disgrace in many ways, they're the two extremes. He came during the night, she came in the middle of the day, and yet the message was the same for both. God loved them, and Christ loved them, and they needed to take a step to restore a relationship with a loving God. I am so thankful for God's love for me. Love, it's shocking how love can impact us momentarily. If one of my children or my wife or even one of you look at me and you just smile or you look at me like you want to come to me, man, I just brighten up. If someone looks at me and turns and walks away or looks at me and gives me some sort of a look that's not so pleasant, just a facial expression you know how that impacts us? Wow! John, wake up. <laughs> Recognize how you can impact others with your facial expressions. The impact of someone who says, I care about you, I seek you, I want a relationship with you, I love you, and all these verses tell us of God's love for us how he seeks us, how he desires. I do not love my daughter more or less. I don't love my sons more or less when they obeyed me or they disobeyed me. I love them because she's my daughter. They're my sons. And I can't not love them. So when we have our feelings go up and down about how well God thinks of us, and we, we tend to want to run and hide like Adam did, let us recognize again these verses and how deeply God loves us. It is this love that God has for us, that Jesus demonstrated for us, that speaks to me and says, we are loved. The word assures me of that. No matter how I think or feel, the true truth of the word assures me that I am absolutely loved. 
and I'm to let nothing or no one or no thought come between me and God's love. That's what's the true truth. There's the fourth thing I'm thankful for. I'm thankful that I know the end of the story. I'm thankful for the gospel. I'm thankful that God absolutely loves me. And I'm thankful for the word of God and his true truth. It is the rock. It is the truth. In a sea of confusion, it is true truth. It reveals who I really am, and it reveals his purpose for me. And right now, in a world that has gone seemingly crazy in the last six or eight or ten months, and not just from COVID, but from demonstrations, it seems like in politics, the, it's all, everything is turned upside down. Wrong is right, and right is wrong, and everybody's opinion seems to be elevated to the, to the place of this is what's truth. In the midst of all that sea of confusion, we have the Word of God that is true truth, absolute truth, and can cut through all of that. And that's why I am so absolutely thankful for the God's Word. And not just that I have His Word, but I'm thankful that as I respond to that Word, my life has changed. You see, it's not just gaining knowledge of the Word. It is, it is knowing the Word, and it is being changed by the words. And so I want to share with you briefly three, three things that are significant in my life, how the Word applied to my life makes a difference. And the first one is, knowing that by my applying the Word to my life, it satisfies the desire of the Father's heart. I began to speak to you of, of the Samaritan woman. If you go on right there in John chapter 4, it talks about the Samaritan woman, and, it says, and Jesus speaks to her and says, the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And catch this. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Jesus was speaking to this Samaritan woman, an outcast, and he was speaking to her, saying, basically, God seeks a worship relationship with you. God seeks your acknowledgement and your worship. God seeks my worship. In Genesis chapter 3, folks, Brett's just getting into it now. But in John chapter 3, I, I appreciate Brett so much, and I've had received so many comments of how deeply we appreciate Brett going through the book of Genesis. Amen? It has been, it has been so healthy. It's challenged us. It's caused us to dig deep. Uh, and I just appreciate Brett. I appreciate his teaching there. But in John chapter 3, and last week, I believe, if I heard it Brett correctly, he was talking about, we don't know exactly how much time had passed uh, since, since there was Adam and Eve and when chapter 3 happened, but in verse 8 it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It speaks to me that that was the norm. Here was Adam and Eve, and here was God, and God would come down and have fellowship with his creation. In part, that's what his purpose in creating them was to have that fellowship. They were spiritual beings that he could relate to and they could relate to him and, and they had fellowship. There in chapter 3, it continues on that they hid from him. But focus on both of these verses, the, the, the one with the Samaritan woman, that God seeks our worship and, and this example of of God coming down into the garden to have fellowship. God seeks my fellowship. And when I have that fellowship with him, and it's through the word that I have that, these verses tell me that it satisfies the Father's heart. He seeks that relationship, but not just a relationship we have through Christ to begin, but that ongoing fellowship with him. 
Frankly, it's a little hard at this time, stage of life when my son's up in Coeur d'Alene and my other son's down in, in Phoenix because it's the time that we have together that brings such joy to my heart. But there's long periods of time where our, our connecting is through text or FaceTime or something like that. It's just not the same as being there. God seeks that relationship with me. He seeks me to have that fellowship with him, to seek him out. And when I study the word, it's like God speaking to me. And when I respond to the word, that's what gives him satisfaction. It pleases him when I have that interaction with him. Let's go back to the illustration with my daughter. I do not love my daughter more or less if she obeys or disobeys. I love her because she's my daughter and I can't not love her. But I enjoy her the most. I feel the closest to her. Well, I reflect back when she was young and she would run out into the living room and jump up into my lap and cuddle up in my lap. And there was that connection, that fellowship. Now she's a little too old to run and jump in my lap. But those times when I have time with her and she's focused on me. There's a lot of time I'm around my kids and they are not focused on me. They're focused on everything else. But, and that brings joy to me as well. But when they turn and they focus their attention on me and we're focused on one another, I think that's what these verses are saying. God seeks our fellowship our focus on him, our looking to him, bright-eyed, God, I am seeking you. And that's what we try and create here on Sunday mornings with our worship songs and all of that. But it can happen anytime throughout the day, throughout the week, when we stop and say, Lord, I want to speak to you. Lord, I want to listen to you. Lord, I just want to be with you. It brings satisfaction to the Father's heart. Number two, the second way of applying it is it's a revealed method for spiritual growth. Revelation demands a response. In James it says that we're to be not just hearers but doers of the word. There's also a passage in Mark that speaks to me, and it's Mark chapter 4, and it says, And he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed, not on a stand? And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear, with what measure you use, with what measure to you, what is measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And to the one who has not, even what he has will take and be away. When I first went to seminary, that that passage was used as a warning. And we're going through the book of of Hebrews right now in my Sunday school class, and, and, and there's, there's all these chapters that here's, here's this truth he wants to be spoken, and then the author includes a warning. And Howard Hendricks gave us a warning. And he says, all of you who have come from a Bible college, be thankful for that. But be aware. You will often come and be complacent. You've heard a lot of this, and you're doing it over again. Frankly, those who come off the university campus who've been tested, who've been challenged. They will come here today to seminary and they will be hungrier than you are that come to a Bible college. And it's that hunger that will drive them to seek into, sink into the Word and not just learn for knowledge, but learn to change their life. And you know what that's like. Maybe you can think back in your life. Maybe you can think of your life right now. Maybe you know a young believer and how absolutely hungry they are and how they hang on every verse of the Scripture, wanting to know and understand how that connects to them. It is a revealed method for spiritual growth. And this verse, this this parable in, in Mark talks about the more we take the Word and the more we respond to it, the more He will give us insight. But if we waste it, perhaps even what we have would be taken away. It's kind of the illustration of how the rich get richer. The more we invest in the Word, the more we respond to the Word, the more will be revealed to us. And that's what I seek. And there have been times where my life's kind of flattened out a little bit. 
And today, I want to be reinvigorated. I want to be like I was as a new believer. Lord, speak to me afresh. From those same verses, speak to me afresh. And I want to respond to them. How much are you changing from what you know? How much are you changing right now? It's a good question for me to ask, and I need to look at my life and say, is God speaking to me? How is he speaking to me? Am I seeking him for life change? See, in that complacency, I can, I can go through and get up every morning. I can read the word and kind of check off a box. Yes, I did that this morning. I was faithful. And there is so great value in that. But the word wasn't given just for us to read and check a box. There's truth in the word, and it's the truth that we respond to that brings growth in my life. The third reason for applying the, life, the, the word that brings joy, to, joy and fulfillment is the third reason is it makes my entire life have meaning. It makes your entire life have meaning. In Jeremiah 18, it talks about the potter and the clay and how he is molding and shaping. It has every right to mold and shape as, as he wills. In Ephesians, it talks about we are his workmanship. We are God's work of art. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It is through the Word of God that God, through the Word that God speaks to me and molds me and does His mighty work in me. God has a plan and a purpose and a design for me. And so it's as I'm in His Word that I can understand His purpose for me. My problem is, sometimes I like to step off of that and go with my plan. I've got a better way. I've got a better plan. And I can never say it like that. I can never say, God, I know what you plan, but I have a better way. That would be ridiculous. So I just don't say the first part. I just say, I, I think I, I know how to, 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 to make this work. And I go off on my, my way. It's when I'm prone to take over and do it on my own that I miss out on what is the work he wants to do in my life. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There is something that is so deeply satisfying when I sense that time when God is speaking, and I listen and I truly hear him speaking into my life. There's something that's so deeply satisfying. It speaks deep inside. I, I recall there's been times when, when perhaps sitting under someone else's ministry, uh, there are certain people I know God has used in my life that, that when I sat and, and would hear them open up the word, it's like somehow they took a knife and they stuck it in and then they twisted it in conviction. And that's a horrible description, and yet it's what I sought most was when I, that God spoke, not to my head, but to my deep heart, my deep longing to be close to him. And when, when God revealed, John, this is how I want to work in your life. I want to make you more like Christ. I want to make you more fulfilled. And the deepest part of me ah, was such satisfaction. I know one person I, I recall, I drove 500 miles to hear them speak because of how God had used them in my life before, and I wanted more of that. So will you pray with me that God will speak deep into you in a conviction to awaken you to things that he wants to do in your life? He still wants each of us to be on that path of growth, of maturity, of becoming more and more like Christ. And I love you all, and I know you love me, but I'm not there yet. There's more God wants to do in my life. I'm deeply thankful. And I, 
through the Word and through applying the Word that my life has meaning. When God speaks into my life through His Word, when I choose to submit to that, when I seek for Him to do His work in my life, that is when my life has true meaning. And I promise you today I'd drive another 500 miles to have God speak to me in that way. And it's harder now because after 50 years, next January, I can become complacent. And my prayer today, and the reason I've listed out these things I'm thankful for, is God has not given up on me. I'm, I don't want to be complacent. I don't want to listen to a verse and say, oh, I know that one. I want to say, Lord, what do you have for me afresh today? Speak into my heart. Satisfy that deep part in me that wants to be more and more like Christ. The Father is seeking fellowship with me right now. He's seeking his fellowship with you right now. The goal is not knowing the word. The goal is transformation by the word. The goal is becoming like Christ through the application of his word that he helps us, the spirit teaches us. And we don't respond in our own strength. That's futile. But as we take a step of faith and we say, yes, God, God will move into our life and assist us in making that change. So folks, there's four things I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for the, the truth of the scripture that tells me that my future, our future, is assured. God will fulfill his plan. I'm thankful for the gospel, the Jesus message that radically changed my life and rescued me and gave purpose to my life. And I am deeply thankful that to know that I am absolutely, unconditionally loved, and how life-altering that is. And I'm thankful for the Word of God. I'm thankful for the Spirit that's within me that illuminates me to the truth. And I'm thankful for the life-changing work that God has to do in my life as I allow Him. Amen? Amen. Jim, come and lead us in worship. stand together, shall we? We'll sing together, my Jesus, I love thee.
Thank you. As John mentioned earlier, there's no Sunday school or anything else that, uh, for the rest of the morning, so you're dismissed to just go and be blessed by being with your families. Have a good morning.